So welcome uh, back to Bedside Ultrasound. We're going to be talking about basic cardiac ultrasound. We will not be going in a lot of uh, pathological issues here uh, in this lecture. Just to keep it at a minimum, we're going to talk basic proposition and anatomy um, for anybody starting out with ultrasound. So there's a lot of indications here. I'm not going to go through and read each one of them. But uh, it can be from your well-appearing patient that's just there with some little difficulty breathing to your very critical uh, recent coded patient um, or just hypotensive. Uh, there's a, uh, a lot of reasons that we can use cardiac ultrasound in evaluating our, our, our patients in the emergency department or in the ICUs for that matter. We do have still uh, some binary questions or focus goals when we do any bedside ultrasound. We are not um, doing full comprehensive studies. We are trying to answer some very specific questions. Um, and these are what uh, what we have here. So, you know, first is there if you've had a coded pa a patient that's recently coded, are you seeing cardiac activity? Um, you know, if there's no cardiac activity, they have a low likelihood of having any survival, and that's um, um, what we first look at. Now, if they have um, cardiac function the, there, you want to look at the LV or the left ventricle, and does the function appear normal? yes then you move on if not then you want to look at it and you want to say you know you're you're going to ask yourself is this uh, severely depressed function of the lv we're not trying to pick up those um, subtle um, hypokinetic regions that's more of a comprehensive study although some of those that, of you that will get uh, more advanced can pick those up and we'll be able to recognize those after we've evaluated the left ventricular function we're just going to say you know is there fluid uh, around the heart is it is there a trace amount that's just barely a sliver there, or is it completely encircling the heart? And if it is encircling the heart, is is it causing any uh, compression of the right ventricular free wall? Uh, if it is, then you've got to worry about tamponade um, as a cause for hypotension or a cause of maybe it's just uh, a uh, um, pericarditis causing your patient's uh, chest discomfort. Additionally, we're going to look at that IVC and we're going to say, you know, is the IVC collapsed? If so, then maybe they are uh, fluid down or volume down. Um, if it's not, what if, it, if it's dilated? Is there any variability? If there's no variability, then they have increased right-sided heart pressures, uh, which could be any number of reasons and it could also give you an indication of why, um, why they're in your emergency department or ICU. And then on any of them, I do like to say, what else? You know, as you do more and more of these, you see things that, that pique your curiosity and say, hey, you know, that doesn't look normal, that doesn't look right. And, you know, sometimes we have to get the, uh, the experts in to look at those, or maybe you'll get comfortable realizing what some of those things are. So we're going to use what's uh, called a phased array probe. This is a low-frequency probe. It's got a very small footprint, and it essentially lets us look between the ribs. Uh, for some of you that are older, you may remember the old flash film. You had film that was faster, had a faster rate, so you could take motion pictures. That's essentially what this does. Or if you use camcorders, you look for, you know, you're trying to find something that has a high uh, frame per second ratio. And if it does, it doesn't quite give you as good a quality of image um, compared to something that can create a still image. But it gives you a pretty good image, especially when something's moving like the heart. And that's what we want this to do. So we have some basic sonographic windows. So uh, remember our sonographic windows are anywhere where you're going to put the, the probe on the patient and it's going to allow us that window to look inside the body and evaluate what's going on. So we have here first our parasternal, apical, and subxiphoid. And I like to go in a clockwise manner. I like to start at the parasternal, go clockwise, apical, subxiphoid. And I like to start in the position of comfort. So if you have somebody that's struggling to breathe and they're sitting up, I like to scan them there. Uh, if if I have to, then I will lay them back a little bit. Uh, sometimes you have to get supine with patients as long as they can tolerate it. And then additionally, you may have to roll them over to their left side. You know, I don't spend a lot of time dwelling in one spot. I try to change their position in order to help me get better images. But I always um, start back and do parasternal, apical, and subxiphoid. And I like to go in that pattern so I don't forget or miss anything um, just because it allows me to stay sequential in everything I do. So on the parasternal long axis, uh, you're, you're going to start with your probe marker towards the patient's right. Uh, it may be directed right at the right shoulder, but it may be just a little left or a little less than that on your angle. Um, so sometimes be anywhere between 9 and 11 o'clock, uh, just depending on the orientation of the patient's heart, is where your probe marker will be pointed. And I like to 
start up here right under the collarbone and drag down yeah most of the time it's going to be in the third or fourth intercostal space but sometimes you're going to you know just the way the patient's positioned or because they have a lot of abdominal fat it's going to be higher or maybe they have copd and it's going to be lower i just like to start high and drag down until i see motion once i see motion i'm going to do those tweaks that we talked about in previous lectures of rotation angling and fanning and i'm going to try to make this the best image i can now, of note, if you have somebody that does have a lot of abdominal obesity, that will push the heart up a little bit, and you may see it higher. If they have COPD or their history of smoking, you may almost feel like you're in a sub-xiphoid view before you find this parasternal long axis. And be patient. This is probably, you know, this is one of the harder studies to develop that technique of looking through the ribs and really seeing what you need to see. When we look at the parasternal long axis, this is what we want to essentially focus on. We want to get the left ventricle, we won't always see the apex, but we want to get it elongated out so it's not blunted, it's not curved here. And we really want to pull in the mitral valve here. We want to be able to see that. That tells us essentially we're in plane. And when we look at our anatomy, we're just going to remember that the right ventricle's a nice tubular structure, but the right ventricular our right ventricle just kind of wraps around it. And here we truly only see kind of the right ventricular outflow track as it's going up to the pulmonary artery. We've got the base of our heart here, and we've got the aortic root, our descending aorta and left lung. And I like to think of it this way, is look at where the arrow is pointing if you're struggling to remember um, where th what things are. So look at your big, meaty chamber of the heart, and that's typically going to be your left ventricle most of the time unless they have other pathological issues, but most of the time it's going to be your left ventricle. And then just look where arrows point to and from it. You know, you've got your mitral valve that's going to be flapping into it or pointing into it, and you know that blood's going to be coming from the left atrium. Um, and then you can see it, you'll see an arrow kind of pointing out and away from it, and this is going to go to the aortic root. Just knowing that, you already have three of the structures defined, and then you know, because you're at the left, uh, the level of the ventricle, you know that your right ventricle is going to be right there also. And then remember that the descending aorta is outside of the um, pericardial sac. Uh, that will help you know that when if you see a, f uh, a, f a fusion come down and it goes anterior to the descending aorta, it's in the pericardial sac. If it comes down and goes deep to it, it's in the uh, left thorax. So if we see a live film of this, um, this is what we see going on. We've got our big, thick, meaty ventricle here. Here's our mitral valve flapping into it. We see nice compression. This is collapsing well. We see that this outflow track or this this is pointing away from it. This is the um, uh, aortic root. So we have left atrium and then we've got this descending aorta back here and then we can remember our right ventricular outflow tracks here. And I'll come off that just a second so you guys can see that well. Um, but this is a normal functioning heart. Uh, if we apply those binary questions this is a normal appearing heart here. When you're in the parasternal long axis, don't lift your probe off the patient. Take your image, uh, whatever you're doing, video clips or still images, and then leave your hand there. Leave it on the chest. Don't take it off because you'll have to find it again because your next view is in that exact same sonographic window. And we want to rotate our um, probe clockwise 90 degrees. And that's going to put us somewhere between the uh, mid clavicle on the left to the left shoulder, uh, typically anywhere between 1 and maybe 3 o'clock. Uh, depending on the body habitus. And that is what that's going to do is it's going to cut the um, ventricle into, or we're going to see that cylinder shape or that circular shape of the left ventricle. So we're going to end up with an image like this. We're going to have uh, anterior to posterior. We're going to see the left or a little bit of the right ventricle wrapped around the left ventricle. It's not going to have the big, um, nice thick wall that the left ventricle has, or it shouldn't in a normal uh, patient. And for beginners, I like to just have people focus on getting it just distal uh, or aiming aiming their probe or fanning their probe a little bit to the apex, just past the mitral valve so they see the papillary muscles. Um, some of you may get to the point uh, with some advanced scanning of looking at the mitral valve, for, but for the majority of you that are just looking um, for what is the cardiac function, this is the, the a good shot to get an idea of what's going on. And you want to see these papillary muscles. They'll show up as two hyperechoic structures within the left ventricle. And it gives you a good idea of what the squeeze is of the left ventricle. Um, so let's take a look at that here. So we see that, that nice thick ventricle. Looks like a donut almost with these two little uh, eyes in it or uh, hyperechoic structures. And we I just like to imagine a little dot sitting right here in the middle of that structure. 
and what is going on with that and how much collapse is there now when you evaluate this and you're thinking of this um, a lot of novice people or novice uh, practitioners to ultrasound will say well it's not collapsing all the way and you got to remember that a normal ejection fraction is above 50 percent it does not have to collapse all the way if those walls are touching each other that's a hyperdynamic uh, heart and that's not normal we want to see that de that space decreased by 50 percent and you looking at it and just saying you know this is what it looks like is uh is pretty good what, as you get experience of evaluating what the ef is and we want to just refer to it as normal um and if not normal is it severely depressed um and in between we're going to call it reduced as we do basic uh, cardiac ultrasound now for the apical remember we're going to pick that probe up off the patient and Everything we do in cardiac ultrasound is rotating on clockwise and we're moving the probe clockwise. So we're gonna lift that probe off the patient. If you can feel for a PMI, great. Um, but typically it's gonna be right in the true nipple line. Uh, in women, it's gonna be right up under that breast flow. You're gonna to wanna to displace the breast up and men kind of get down under the pec muscle and go right uh, in those ribs and you'll feel a little space there and put the probe there. You're gonna rotate your uh, probe marker to about the three o'clock position. Sometimes you'll have to rotate maybe two to four o'clock depending on uh, the angle of the ribs and what the heart's looking like. But we're gonna end up with a view somewhat like this and it's an apical four chamber. There are some other apical views, but for the basic cardiac ultrasound, I would recommend just doing apical four for now um, until you get some experience. And we should see if you're not seeing all four chambers, you need to fan, you need to rotate, you need to optimize that image to see it all. Because this one, this image is a little bit harder to obtain than the other cardiac views, but it is definitely worth it because it gives you a lot of information as you watch it. And I will tell you though, also, because this view is a little bit different, I have people underestimate the ejection fraction quite often on this. So get used to seeing this view. It's, uh, it's a little bit different than the others, um, but it does provide a lot of information. So we're gonna find our big left ventricle here. It's gonna be nice and thick. And then we're gonna have our right ventricle kind of over here. Uh, it's gonna be thinner walled, but they'll be at the same level. And then just remember where are the valves pointing and those are gonna be your atria above them. And occasionally you'll see your descending aorta sitting right up here above the left atria. And then remember everything kind of surrounding is your left lung. Now, when you look at this view, please remember that the apical view is the least sensitive for finding a pericardial effusion. Now, if it's a large pericardial effusion, absolutely, you're going to see it. But if it's a small trace effusion or a trace pericardial sac fluid, you will not see it because it is. Um, it could just be in a gravity dependent portion, and you may not be visualizing it on this on this image. So, if we go to a action, an ultrasound here, we can see this left ventricle. It's nice and thick. We can appreciate this little inner wall here valves flapping up in there it's collapsing well this image of the gain could have been a little bit better distributed it's a little bright down here at the bottom but we can appreciate uh, <clears throat> the left atrium the right atrium and we see our right ventricle right ventricle should be about 60 percent or 0.6 compared to the left ventricle some people say it can even be acceptable up to one but i personally once it gets up to a, they're looking the same size. You know, I consider that to be some right ventricular hypertrophy or, or not hypertrophy, but dilated right ventricle. Um, Subxiphoid, we're going to continue to uh, move the probe in a clockwise manner. This time we are not going to rotate the probe. Now, don't let this confuse you. For those of you that uh, have listened to the FAST lecture, our probe marker is towards the right, but you got to remember we've switched to cardiac setting in most or at least most of you will um, have switched to a cardiac setting for this and when you do uh, your pro your your probe marker and your um, your probe indicator are going to be a little bit different so on a cardiac setting you're going to leave your probe marker pointed towards the patient's left that's still that three o'clock position and then you're going to aim uh, push up push down with pressure first keeping that probe perpendicular to the skin once you push down a ways um, and slowly so they don't feel like you punched them in the stomach then you're going to turn your probe and aim it up towards that left shoulder and once you get up to that left shoulder you're going to get a view that looks like this you'll see your liver you'll see you're going to use that as a sonographic window your right ventricle will be laying on top of the, or right underneath that 
and at the same level will be the left ventricle and you'll see that nice big thick uh, meaty wall and then you'll be able to tell where your valves are and where those are uh, pointing to and coming from and that will define your atria um, so let's take a look here at a, an ultrasound image of that so we see this nice big thick wall right there over here this is our left ventricle all right here our right ventricle is going to be here it's very small uh, on this image compared to the left ventricle uh, definitely not as thick walled um, but this is our uh, same level so that helps us define them and then we just watch these valves that are flipping up into the ventricles and know that those are the atria lying bef beneath them so this is another four chamber view and this is a good view um, for determining if there's a pericardial effusion I don't find this Sometimes this can be very helpful for estimating ejection fraction, and especially COPD patients, but sometimes obese patients, this can be a very difficult view, so don't get too frustrated if, the, if that's an issue. Now with the IVC, we're going to keep our probe in essentially the same place. I'm not going to, I'd let off on your pressure, stand it up, and now you're going to rotate the probe marker towards the feet. Um, and staying right in the middle, you're going to fan over and look at the patient's right side and as you fan across you're going to be looking at the liver and you're going to come across till you see the IVC and we want to see because of this plane because you're in the middle you should see liver on it on this side now you are the IVC does course behind it but as you go from midline over to the right you are going to capture capture this right lobe of the liver behind the IVC and another thing to help you determine this is the IVC is the hepatic vein coming in now the reason why I say look for liver behind it and here the hepatic vein is because a lot of people stand it up look straight down and they'll see that aorta right underneath there and they'll determine that to be the um, IVC and they don't appreciate any collapse and they interpret you know that as being a dilated or high CVP for, on the patient please be careful of that uh, that's a, a novice mistake um, just make sure that you're you're looking over and seeing at least the hepatic vein coming in or a little bit of liver behind it and really focus on if you know if that's the IVC or the aorta so here we can see uh, this image here. We can see the variability. Um, I'm not, we have a little bit of, you have the pulsations from the emptying of the atria. But you can also see that here the patient's breathing and that's as that decreases the intrathoracic pressure, the IVC is able to empty uh, a little bit more into the right atria. Um, and that gives us some uh, respiratory variation. <clears throat> And as you know, you can see some right lung here, so you may see a, per, uh, a uh, pleural fusion or right thoracic fluid occasionally on this view. So um, there are several tables out there that describe this. This has been well described that you can determine a CVP. Uh, take the pitfalls of using a CVP and determining what a volume status is or fluid responsiveness. Um, um, I'm not going to go into detail of that, but respiratory variation can help you know what a CVP is at least. Um, I kind of look at it this way. I, I struggle to memorize this table. I look at it as a slit-like and collapsed. If it is, I've got a low CVP. If it's dilated like this one <clears throat> and has some respiratory variation, uh, which this is probably close to 50%, uh, then they probably have a normal uh, to normal high uh, CVP. If it's dilated without collapse, um, or less than 50% collapse, then they've got an elevated CVP. And if they have a dilated IVC without any collapse, then they have a significantly elevated CVP. Um, and I think that's just easier than always coming back to this table. Now, some of you may be cl um, calculating a, uh, a collapsibility index, and that's great. Um, and th for this, the, the aspects of this lecture, we're just talking about variation um, and how that relates to CVP for now. Um, hopefully you found that uh, helpful. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or comments on, on cardiac ultrasound. Um, and that's just the basic anatomy. Uh, hopefully we'll have some pathology uh, slides and some normals up for you.